everybody and welcome back to How to Get Better at World Warships Episode 7 and today I'm going to be covering the sort of the basics that you have to know about carriers in order to do well with them. Now do keep in mind that in this particular video I'm going to not talk about specific ships and how they function. So I'm not really going to be spending time talking about Graf Zeppelin or Indomitable, you know, ships that have sort of special quirks to them. I'm going to focus on the tech tree lines and sort of what they're all about as well as I'm going to be talking about how to set them up in terms of skills and modules. Also going to be talking about how to attack with your aircraft, uh, how to dodge flak, how to do slingshots, uh, how to preserve your airplanes to the best of your ability, and also finally how to position your carrier. Those are going to be the sort of topics during this video. First things first, tech tree lines. So you've got three major tech tree lines right now, the British, American, and Japanese carriers. Really, if you want to think about it, the British are the easiest ones to play, the Japanese being the hardest. And of course, in terms of maximum ability to do uh, damage and impact in the game, the British will have the lowest and the Japanese will be the highest. Japanese primarily able to do that because their AP dive bombers combined with their relatively good torpedoes will allow them to output a lot of damage. The US carriers are very good general all around uh, type carriers. They can do just about everything. But in terms of, for example, like their bomb output in terms of damage is not as high as the Japanese. The British are the easiest ones to play. They take very little skill. But of course, that also limits their overall effectiveness um, in the long run. Anyways, in terms of setting up your carrier module-wise and captain skills-wise, you have to make some very, very good decisions based on what your carrier line is good at or how you want your particular carrier to play. So let me use my midway as an example. Again, please you know, consider how your carrier will play as well, right? So for my Midway, I've set her up like this. I'm using the Tiny Tim rockets, which are very, very good rockets. They do a lot of damage, good pen, but they're not very effective against, let's say, destroyers. But I tend to play her with the sort of intention of doing just as much damage as humanly possible and impacting the game that way. So I've built her with these rockets in mind, and you'll see that when I chose the modules, I opted to get, you know, Attack Aircraft Mod 1. It, increases the attack aircraft's attack time by two seconds so i have a little bit more time to sort of engage into the um, attack animation and then fly in also decided to get the attack aircraft mod 2 so giving my rocket aircraft a little bit more hp because the reason i'm not doing it for like let's say the dive bombers or whatever is because you can utilize the um, you know techniques like slingshotting or whatever to mitigate the um, amount of damage that your planes are going to take for the Midway, which has access to Flight Control Mod 1, this is the preferred uh, module for me over Concealment System Mod 1, mostly because this allows me to have more aircraft uh, sort of at the ready at the beginning and also get them back a little bit faster. Certain carrier lines with really, really stealthy aircraft, you could definitely consider you know, Concealment Systems Mod 1. And then finally, of course, opted for Air Groups Mod 2, just bulking these aircraft up so they can tolerate a little bit more AA fire. Um, some people might consider wanting faster squadrons. That could be something that you yourself have to decide, but I prefer a little bit more durability. So this is how I sort of designed it, right? I wanted it this way, so I designed the modules to go in this kind of direction. So in terms of the skills for the captain, this is generally how I would do it in this particular scenario for the midway. So I opted for air supremacy first, which allows me to recover airplanes a little bit faster. Uh, when I mean by recover, I mean like, you know, recover the ones that have been shot down, right? You know how there's a bit of a timer that takes? Yeah, this will help. I also opted for torpedo acceleration. I want my torpedo planes to be able to drop torpedoes a little bit further back so they're, you know, able to be a little bit more preserved because they're not going through the entirety of the close range AA, for example. Um, then you can get aircraft armor and survivability expert, so you can get these two skills. And then for me, because I'm running Tiny Tims, I'm running Site Stabilization as the next skill. Why? Because I want the reticle to shrink down as quickly as possible. Once I've done that, I've opted for Last Gasp. Last Gasp is a very, very useful slingshot skill. Because what it allows you to do, and I'll show you this maybe a little bit later, is that um, you know when you're down to your last two squadrons, you're going to engage with one, and that aircraft is going to be outside of AA range. You're going to slingshot in with your last squadron. The last squadron is going to have a full boost bar, and that'll allow you to attack and you know do the whole slingshot very, very quickly. Finally, last two skills, improved engine for just faster squadrons, and demo expert because my bombs and my rockets will both benefit from it. 
Of course, other carriers are going to be built a little bit differently. For example, you know, obviously, if you're building, let's say, a Japanese carrier, well, then Demo Expert doesn't really make much sense. You might opt for something like Last Gas because you want the slingshot and run Concealment Expert, so your plane's a little bit stealthier. It's a little bit harder for surface ships to spot you, and you have more of a surprise factor, which the American carriers do not. Skill builds for carriers are something you will definitely have to put some thought into and really sort of figure out how do you want to design the skill to fit your carrier and your playstyle. And that just about does it from the port view. Let's go into a training room and let me show you the next few things to keep in mind when you're playing carriers. Alrighty, so here we are in the training room and from here I'm going to talk about some of the very, very first things you got to know about carriers in terms of the very fundamentals about how to attack correctly. So of course, first things first, if you want to launch a squadron, you press 1, 2, or 3 to select your squadron and then press the number again to launch it. So I want to launch a rocket squadron, so I'm going to press 1, 1. And the squadron is up. Now you'll notice that in the sort of right over here, nope, not, not there, right here you'll notice how there is 7 out of 9. That means there's still 7 rocket planes remaining on the carrier, but there's 2 more that need to be recharge let's say before I have another full squadron there you can hold down the alt key in order to see how long another airplane will take in order to recharge and you'll see it be another 48 seconds before I get eight out of nine all right in terms of the aircraft themselves they function with the WASD keys in order to move so W to boost and speed up S key to slow down and of course if you combine the S key with the A or D keys to turn the aircraft do make smaller circles a, of course, is to turn to the left, D key to turn to the right. You also notice, for example, that if you move your mouse to the left or to the right, that the little reticle there sort of moves along with where you're moving the aircraft. And this is a very important thing because the mouse moving affects that reticle less. So, you know, while the A and D keys will massively affect the size of that reticle when you're actually engaging in, the mouse movement is you know, far less impacting the size of the reticle. Very, very useful for things like torpedo bombers. Anyhow, the white circle, that is basically where your aircraft are going to have the rockets ready to go. So typically, you're going to be aiming with that. You're going to say, all right, let's say I'm going to go after this Kremlin here. When the white circle is over the ship, I'm going to left click my mouse and I'm going to engage in the attack animation. And of course, when the circle goes to green, I'm going to fire my rocket. So here we go, yellow, yellow, green, and rockets fired and able to do some damage there. This, of course, is the most basic aspect of attacking, and it is true for rocket planes, for um, dive bombers, and even though for torpedo bombers it's not the same, it is quite similar. So I'm going to show you the torpedo bombers now. So torpedo bombers, unlike the dive bombers or the rocket planes, don't have such an obvious reticle. In fact, you might even find it a little bit hard to spot. You notice that there is a bit of an arrow like right there. It's sort of like, I don't know, it's kind of pointing towards your aircraft. And you notice that when you move left or right, you know, that little arrow sort of moves along with your aircraft. That is how you line up towards your target. Now, do remember um, that unlike the uh, rocket planes or the dive bombers, which, you know, have that... Um, sort of guaranteed like this is where you're going to have the rockets ready to go the torpedo bombers you know you you got to learn the actual individual planes you got to learn how fast they're able to get the reticle to tighten and how much distance you need to let these aircraft run before they get to target all right so i'm going to go bomb the kremlin and of course i am going to ideally want to approach a ship from the side as torpedo bombers want to approach from the side ideally so once again, I'm going to sort of fly my airplanes until I can see that I'm going to be, you know, sort of attacking from the side before I'm going to turn. I'm going to use the arrow to sort of point myself at a position, you know, sort of near the ship. So here we go. I think that's about right. So here we go. Click. And you'll see it takes quite a while for the reticle to tighten down. So with the torpedo bombers, you've got to give yourself the right amount of time. Now you'll notice that I'm using the mouse right now to sort of go back and forth and you'll notice that the impact on the reticle movement is very, very small. 
I'm going to now attack the other Kremlin. I'm going to show you what happens when I do the same sort of twitching motion, but with the A and D keys instead, instead of with my mouse. So here we go. Engage the attack animation, right? So let me show you the difference again. This is with the mouse. You'll notice that it changes a little bit, but I can kind of get it, you know, make, make small adjustments, no problem. But look at what happens when I press A or D. Do you see how that immediately becomes really, really big? And when it becomes that size, it becomes very hard to drop accurately. Right, so you can still make small adjustments, just do not touch your A and D keys. All right, so just for satisfaction's sake, because we obviously want to see some torpedo hits, uh, I'm gonna go bomb this Kremlin again. I'm gonna speed up here, engage the attack animation. See, it takes quite a while for the USN torpedo bombers to get you know into a small, tight uh, reticle. With other nations, it is quite a bit easier, and then of course. Where you see there's a sort of a dividing zone between the yellow and the green, that is how long it takes for torpedoes to actually arm. And you'll see that those torpedoes armed right at the sort of intersection between the yellow and the green. So once again, here we go. So you see the yellow that's closer to your aircraft, and then there's the green section where the yellow and the green meet, that's where your torpedoes are armed. When you're dropping against an enemy ship, you wanna make sure that that line is sort of a little bit before the ship so that the ship has very little time to react to armed torpedoes but also you have a little bit of room just in case they maneuver the next part of course is combining what you just learned about attacking and combining it with flak avoidance now flak is one of the things that is most likely to knock off a whole chunk of your squadron yes ships have continuous dps and they'll slowly take away your hp but if you run to flak cloud you're going to definitely be hurting so one of the first things to keep in mind is that when you're about to get into the range of the enemy ship's uh, flak bubble, what you probably need to be doing is accelerating by using the boost. So here I am using my rock planes, approaching Kremlin, and you'll see that right as the AA starts coming up, I am boosting. Now, by increasing speed dramatically, and also banking a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and a little bit more to the left again, it allows me to basically avoid all the flak bubbles. Once again, of course, is that at the very, very end, I want my reticle to have been the white circle reticle to be over the ship so I can engage my attack animation and wait for the reticle to shrink down so I can get as many of my uh, ordnance on target. So here I am doing the sort of the exact same thing again, this time using slower dive bombers. Now, of course, do keep in mind that both this and the previous uh, clip with the rock planes has been slowed down just so it's easier for me to explain. Once again, I'm gonna approach this target a little bit on the slower side, you know, cruising speed, a couple of knots up. You'll see sometimes I'll accelerate up a little bit and then, you know, wait for the speed to drop off. But when I get into the range of the AA, you'll notice that I go pretty much to full speed. And I'll very aggressively turn first to, let's say, the right, then I will turn to the left, then the right again, then the left again. Basically allowing the flak burst to sort of spawn in a line in front of me, and then when that's happening, I'm already turning the other direction, so if the next wave spawns, it's going to be sort of ahead of me in that direction, and then I'm turning away again. So you're always trying to keep yourself in that sort of, you know, bobbing and weaving kind of approach. And then one final thing to keep in mind is that with the flak bursts, do remember that the actual effective duration of those flak bursts is still relatively short. At a certain point in time, they become nothing more than just graphical black little puffs of cloud, and they don't actually do anything. For torpedo bombers, there's another little thing to keep in mind. Um, don't get caught by the flak clouds when you're in this dive part of the animation. But once you get past it and you're at this sort of sea level attack animation, um, the flat clouds are more just cosmetic. And the only thing you're really worried about is the continuous DPS. Uh, do, of course, learn how much attack time you have on your torpedo bombers, you know, sort of how much time you need to give them to actually sort of narrow their cone and also have a good understanding of what the AA ranges you're going to run into are. Still, you do have the issue, regardless, that you still have to dodge flak and you still have to absorb a lot of damage through the continuous DPS. Well, what if there is a way to kind of avoid most of it? And this is where slingshots come in. And the way slingshots work is it's exploiting a mechanic, which is during this part where your bombs are dropping, after you engage the attack animation, and you know, who cares what the circle is, as long as it's green, it can drop the bombs you drop. 
During this intermediate phase where you don't have control over the remaining squadron, take a look at the HP bar and you'll notice that the HP isn't dropping at all. It's only when right here, when I sort of regain control of my aircraft, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, almost here, there, as soon as I sort of regain control of my aircraft, this is when you start to see the HP start ticking again. But you'll notice that I'm already right on top of this target, and I can immediately engage into the attack animation again. And there's very, very little damage that I will actually take. Uh, in this particular case, I think I was a touch slow on the speed, and so I will end up losing one of these aircraft, and I'm not going to get the perfect drop off. But if you do this correctly, you're going to be able to do it without losing any planes at all. So here we go once again, um, you know, doing the same thing again, this time properly. So I'm going to accelerate, and as soon as I get to about the correct distances, and you do have to learn exactly what the correct distances are. So you'll see I'm accelerating, and then right at about here, about 7.9 kilometers, you'll notice I engaged the attack animation. I'm going to wait for the circle to go green so I can drop my bombs. You'll notice there goes the bomb drop, and now I have no control of my aircraft. My remaining squadron is just going to zoom past the majority of this Kremlin's AA, the flak, it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to take any real damage, and then as soon as I regain control of the other squadron, and you know I'm ready to go for the attack again, I'm going to be able to engage the uh, attack without really having to worry about much uh, AA issues coming from this Kremlin. Now every carrier, and this is important, every carrier has a different distance that they want to be using. So if you're playing, let's say, Indomitable, it's about, let's say, 9.5 kilometers. With the Midway, it's a little bit shorter. You also have to factor in whether or not the enemy ship is moving towards you or away from you. So in actuality, when you're in battle, you do have to make adjustments to the distances, and you do have to learn that. But still, this is a very, very effective way to basically mitigate pretty much any type of AA in the game, so long as you're skilled enough to do so. Now, do keep in mind, this is also very, very useful if you're trying to attack a ship that's being protected by, like, let's say, a heavier AA escort. Um, you also might want to consider getting, like, the last gasp skill, because it gives you that, you know, full boost bar in the final squadron, so you can just zoom in as fast as you can execute the attack and then drop. It also mitigates the amount of time you're spending trying to reach your target and then during that period of time eating a damage from the continuous DPS. Now there's two other things to talk about and that has to do with plane preservation, so trying to keep as many planes as possible. One of the first things to do is to discard an extra squadron at the beginning of the uh, launch. So in this case, I know I'm going to be attacking a Kremlin, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to bring the entire full squadron because I'm probably just going to be losing some airplanes for no real reason. So ditch one of the squadrons at home. So I'm going to come in with, you know, three quarters of the squadron. I'm going to be able to make the attack and not have to worry about losing those three extra planes in case I screw up on something. This is also useful when you're attacking, let's say, a carrier, right? Don't send in the full squadron because the carrier has a lot of strong AA and the fighter. So what you do is you ditch the extra squadron, go in with only two, do your attack, drop your torpedoes, and then get out. The other thing is a quasi-exploit of the slingshot. Did you notice that as soon as I finished the attack, one of my squadrons zoomed up straight into the sky really, really quickly? So remember how slingshot works, right? Where you know you have that section of time when you're not getting any control, but your planes are zooming super fast? Well, as soon as you finish your attack animation, before you get control of your squadron again, if you hit the F key, the remaining squadrons enter that slingshot return. And they actually come back faster, and you don't lose as many planes. That's another way to preserve aircraft, just in case you're attacking something and you don't want to be like, okay, I'm going to bomb you, and then I have to dodge your flak and AA and continuous DPS, all that, all the way out while losing planes in the process. You just do the attack, hit the F key, and bring your planes back home. The last thing to talk about today is a bit of carrier positioning. Now, what you generally want to do as a carrier in terms of positioning is to be as close to the action as you can possibly be in your carrier, but not close enough where you get shot at. So take a look at where your front line is, where your supporting line ships are, and you just be a little bit behind them. Because the closer you are to the action with your ship, the less time your planes take to fly to the action. The less time it takes for your planes to fly to the action, the more strikes you can get off. In this particular game, if you're watching, I'm in an Arc Royal, we're in a tier 8 game. 
you know, it's just me and this Akazuki. I'm desperately needing this Akazuki to cap this game out. But the enemy team has, you know, basically two ships on our cap. So by being this close, literally, you know, like two squares away, grid squares away from the enemy, I will always be able to keep them reset because my planes are going to be able to cycle to target that much faster, especially since I'm playing Arc Royal with really, really slow planes. Now, I'm not saying be suicidal like where I am because this is a pretty suicidal position normally. Of course, I'm doing this because I know this will get me the win. But in a normal game, you have to consider where you need to be in your carrier to be just close enough to be able to get off as many strikes as possible. If you're finding yourself in CV games going to like A1 or A10 or J1 or J10, you're going to like corners of the maps, you're basically totally ineffective. Even though you do have aircraft that can fly the distance, you're just too darn far away from the action. Anyways, folks, that is all for today's How to Get Good at World of Warships video covering the very sort of fundamentals of carrier play. Of course, there are going to be more videos coming in the series, including more on uh, carriers in more detail uh, in the not too distant future. So stay tuned. Aside from all that, have yourselves a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to all of you again soon. Mm -hmm.